morning, Saints of First Christian Church. We'd like to welcome all of you who are here as well as watching online in particular. Um, Kathy and Jerry are celebrating a special birthday today with Audrey, and so we want to wish you a very happy birthday. It is a pleasure to worship with you, sweetheart, and we are so thankful that you are watching with us right now. But today we are going to focus on the crucifixion. We focus on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Now the sermon's going to be broken up into two parts. The first part, we're going to examine the scriptures and understand what sacrifice is. The history of it. Why was it implemented? Because when we understand that, it will then lead us into understanding the second part of the sermon, which is the sacrifice of Christ. But we're going to be looking at the crucifixion and I always get nervous when pre preachers say this, but hear me out, um, in, in a different way. Usually that's a banner for, let's look at heretical teaching. But really, what I'm saying is, is I want us to look at the crucifixion through a medical standpoint. What was the physical trauma that Jesus might have endured through crucifixion? I want us to do this so that we can paint and see and experience the crucifixion a little bit deeper. And so sacrifice. It's not new to the Bible. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. And when we're faced with this, we understand that, we ha that, that there's a problem. Well, why is sacrifice even implemented? Okay, well, because of sin. Well, let's go back. Well, what is sin? And so we see in the Garden of Eden, we look around and we see that God has created everything perfect. We see Adam and Eve, there's no sin, there's no cancer, there's no politics. Can you grasp how perfect this is? And yet God has placed one tree. And, and some people will see this and say that God was trying to set us up for failure. But you know something? If God wanted to create robots that just obeyed, he could. But he wanted an organic relationship with the creation. And in order to be obedient, we have to have the ability to be disobedient. In order for us to love, we have to have the freedom to hate. But in a world that is filled with hate, does that not make love even sweeter? And so we see that this is not some conspiracy for God to set us up for failure. It's because he wanted an organic relationship with his creation that truly loved him the way that he loves us. And so they eat from the tree of the knowledge of, of, of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sinning against God. It's like the saying goes, you had one job, and you couldn't even do it. And so sin floods into God's creation, fracturing everything. And what does God do? He extends grace. And how does he extend this grace? He extends it through our ability to sacrifice animals on our behalf. But this faces us with a very simple truth. Sin is a problem. Sin must be addressed. Sin must be brought to an account. Well, why is that? Well, that answer is found in understanding what sin is and who is it is against. Looking at the latter, our sin is against God. Now, we understand that there are people who we care for who get caught in the crossfire of our sin, but our sin is against God. And if God is holy, which he is, then the problem of sin must be addressed because it is unholy. And if God is just, which he is, then a holy God will address this problem. He won't just sit back and let it rain. If he is holy, it must be addressed. And if he is just, he will address it. And so what does God do? He extends grace. He establishes the law and his prophets lay out what sacrifices are and what their purpose is to be. Now there are five kinds of offerings in the Old Testament. We have burnt offerings, grain offering, fellowship offering, sin offering, and guilt offering. We're going to be focusing on the sin offering. What you find in Leviticus 4 is the sin offering. And as you read through Leviticus 4, you will find it to be repetitive. 
Now, Bible College 101, if the Bible repeats itself, it's important. Like a parent, I told you to stop touching the hot stove. Why? Because it's important. So you hear it a million times, right? If the Bible repeats itself, it's repeating itself for a reason. But some of the things we find as it's going through this, we'll see that you need a bull, goat, or lamb. We see the blood is to be sprinkled, the fat of the lamb is to be removed and burned, and the rest of the animal is to be burned. But two more phrases we see pop up, without blemish. This means that the bull, goat, or lamb that is to be sacrificed is not to be the one that's already on death's door. You bring the crippled one, the the one that's old and about to die. No. If we are to bring a sacrifice, it is to be our best bull, goat, or lamb. And so you see that this is a significant even financial commitment because you're bringing your best to be sacrificed. The other phrase you see is lay your hand on the animal. Now laying your hand on an animal is twofold. First, they are acknowledging their sin and that there is a penalty that is due that sin. And number two, it is a transferal of sin. You are placing your hand on an animal, the best animal that you have, bull, goat, or lamb, and you are declaring that my sin needs to be punished and that what is about to happen to this animal should be done unto me. It is not a fun experience. Some of you may be listening to this and going, wow, that's pretty messed up. An innocent animal dies because we can't stop sinning. And to one degree, you're right. But to another, it is gracious for God to offer us a scapegoat for our sin. Now, why are human beings given this grace? This is another question that will come up. If there's sacrifice, why does God offer sacrifice? Why does God allow us to have this forgiveness through the blood of animals? Well, it's because human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are image bearers of God. One pastor rightfully stated, We have an intrinsic value because of the image God has given to us. It is not a functional thing as it is a gift from God. You see, this is why as Christians we can outright hold fast that a child that is born, even with severe deformities, medical conditions, or mental retardation, they are far more valuable than any animal life. Even more valuable than, say, secretariat. A, a horse that has won, that won over $1.5 million, a horse whose stud fee was about $2,000 a pop. And yet we can look at every single child that comes from the womb and say, that child is more valuable than that horse. Every single time. Because an image bearer has more value than the greatest horse athlete that has ever lived. A human is a pinnacle of God's creation, and therefore God extends grace and allows us to transfer our sin to animals because it is gracious of him to do so. But here's the problem. Hebrews 10.4, Paul addresses this and says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, I've used this example before, but if we could visualize, um, if we can visualize wet concrete, Any kid who sees wet concrete just sees it as an opportunity to express their artistic side. And I'm sure we all have done it at some point. But if you imagine wet concrete, we begin to walk, and as we walk, we leave footprints behind us, and as we stop and look back, we see we've ruined it. The sacrifice of an animal, we transfer our sins, the animal's blood is poured out, cleansing us of our our, our misdeeds, and it smooths out what is behind us. But life goes on. We must continue. We begin to walk some more. And as we look back, we see yet more footprints. You see that it's not erasing every footprint. It is erasing what has come up to that point. And the animal sacrifice is cleansing us of the sin up to that point. But life goes on. What about what lies ahead? Paul is addressing that the blood of goats and animal, or blood, the blood of goats and bulls, cannot uh, forgive sins. 
And so Paul establishes very clearly that there is a punishment due sin, and that sin requires blood. You see, sin is not some oopsie-daisy of the cosmos. Sin is treason against the one true God. It is idolatry of the heart as we replace him with sin. As we step into a place of God and declare what is right for us. Sin is no small mistake as our world would lead you to believe. Sin is treason and the only punishment for treason, even in the great, great United States, is death. God extended grace that animals would bear our sin, but it covered our sin up to the point. But then we kept on sinning. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And so let's break this down. A wage is what is earned. Well, what has been earned? Death. Why? Because the wage of sin, what is earned, what is paid, is death. And so finite creatures, bulls, goats, and lambs, cannot address an eternal problem. Finite creatures cannot address an eternal problem problem and our sin is against the eternal God and creator finite beings cannot bring to an account an eternal wrong which brings us to the latter half of Romans 6 23 but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus Christ is an eternal sacrifice which would cover sin because he is holy not a single shred of sin present. He is spotless. He is without blemish. And this sacrifice would bring our eternal sin to an account because he is eternal and infinite. And because he is eternal and infinite, this single sacrifice would be able to be multiplied again and again and attributed to any and all who receive it. So we understand that sacrifice is going to be required to pay the penalty due our sin. And this brings us to the sacrifice of Christ. His sacrifice was to address sin in a way that would not cover it up up to a point, but that it would bring to an account paid in full our sin, making us right before God. And so to add more to the sacrifice of Christ, I've taken time to examine the crucifixion from a medical standpoint. And that being said, I don't know medical words. So we're just going to phonetically work through this together. Okay? Body parts have special names that for some reason someone decided they should be impossible to say. So we're going to work through that together. Some may argue that the Romans crucified thousands upon thousands of people. In fact, on that day that Jesus was crucified, there were two other men who were crucified. What makes Jesus' crucifixion so special? Thousands of people were crucified. Why is he any different? And there's a lot of things we can get into with this, but let's, I just want to focus on three. Number one, because all those who were crucified were sinners. Even if they crucified an innocent person, Innocent by the punishment that they were given. Maybe they didn't steal the goat. Maybe they didn't kill the person. But they were still sinners. Number two, they bore the guilt of punishment as carried out by the Roman authorities. And number three, which kind of joins one and two together, but focusing on Christ, Jesus was holy. He was perfect. He was without sin. And he died in place of sinners. This is what makes the crucifixion different. He endured the cross for you and me. Why? So that sinners like you and me would be called sons and daughters. Now we begin the story looking at the Garden of Gethsemane. I appreciate you not taking my thunder here. I was worried. Luke 22, we're going to be looking at verses 39 through 46. And he came out and went at his, as it was his habit to the Mount of Olives... And the disciples also followed him. Now when he arrived to the place, he said to them, Pray that you do not enter, that you not come into temptation. 
And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away and knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel of heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow, and he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you do not come into temptation. The text says that he sweat, that he sweat like drops of blood. Hemophydrosis is a rare condition and a rare event. In fact, there are nine recorded instances of this. And in these nine cases, all of which came from extreme stress and fear of something, and we know that seven of those came as those who were awaiting execution the following day. Well, what is it? This is when the capillary ruptures in every sweat gland on the body and it pours out of the body. It results in sweating blood. At this time, Jesus was arrested. Jesus was passed back and forth between Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate, and this is where we pick up in the story. Luke 23, verses 13 through 16. Now Pilate summoned to himself the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and he said to them, You brought this man to me on the ground that he is inciting the people to revolt. And behold, after examining him before you, I have found no basis at all in the case of this man for the charges which you are bringing against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now, in this whole process, we find that a man named Barabbas, and which is the only place that he is mentioned in Scripture, we know that he's a criminal. We know that he was involved with an insurrection earlier. But this is the only place he is mentioned. And Barabbas is let free, even though there is no fault brought against Jesus. And I'm looking at this saying, well, nothing's changed. We would much rather have sin run amok than have the very presence of God among us. But the irony of this trial is still felt today. You have men standing in judgment of the one who is actually judge of all. Jesus Christ is the supreme judge, and yet human beings stood in place of judgment of him. But Herod goes on, he says, therefore I will punish him. And so Jesus was beaten and flogged before he was to be crucified. During this flogging, the person would have been stripped naked. This was common ground in the process of beating and crucifixion because being naked was shameful and they wanted to bring about as much shame as possible. The person would be stripped naked and, and chained to a post. The instrument that was used is something that we've called the cat of nine tails. Now for many of us, we would assume that it would have nine lashes. But that's actually not true. It could have upwards of 12 lashes on it. But upon each individual lash, they wove in sharp objects, broken glass, iron shards, or bone. But on each individual lash, there was a, a lead weight. The purpose of this lead weight was to strike the body, which would cause the body to rush blood to the surface to treat the trauma. But then we would find that the, the iron, the shards, the glass, the bone would then cut into the body. They've done experiments and speculated that a single strand on the cat of nine tails with one swipe could create a cut two inches long and nearly three quarters of an inch deep. Medically, a wound like this would require 20 stitches to close up, which means that with every whip, that was inflicted by nine of these individual lashes, we could be looking at upwards of 180 stitches with one swipe. By the end of the beating, we would be looking at nearly 2,000 stitches required to close up every wound. Why might Jesus have not died from this? After all, there were those who died from the beating alone and never got to the cross. Why would Jesus not bleed out? 
Well, for one, this, was do, this happened during the summer months, which means overnight it is very cold. And when Jesus was beaten, it still would have been cool, which would have, which would have caused the capillaries to constrict, making the blood loss as minimal as possible. He still would have bled a lot. But because it was cold, his capillaries would have constricted and he would have bled less. The purpose of the cat of nine tails was to pull skeletal muscle out of the body so that when the person was hanging on the cross, those muscles would be weak and ineffective. See, this is why survival on the cross was dependent upon how bad their scourging was before. If they were beaten brutally, then they would not last long on the cross. Or if the legionnaires were tired or they wanted the person to suffer more on the cross, they wouldn't beat them as much or as hard. But the determination of someone's span on the cross was determined by the beating that proceeded. Following this beating, Jesus was mocked and abused some more with the crown of thorns. Matthew 27, 27 through 31 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the patrium and gathered uh, the whole Roman cohort to him, and they stripped him and put a red cloak on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, put a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, took the reed and beat him in the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the cloak off of him, put his own garments back on him, and led him to be crucified. The thorns fashioned were meant to mock, not mock Caesar, but they meant to mimic a, the crown that Caesar wore. The plants that were available had many thorns, and, and, and they varied in length, but there were thorns that could upward reach three inches. But what's so incredible is they are so strong that they could easily pierce the outer wall of the skull. Not to mention, with them piercing his head, that would have severed blood vessels, causing even more blood loss. All the while they did this, they worshipped him, mocking him. And note, these are the same people that Jesus was dying for. They did this to mock. In fact, even the sign that hung among Jesus was to mock his lordship. In John 19, 19 through 22, now Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where he was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, rather write that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So typically the victim would just carry out the crossbeam to the crucifixion because the vertical, uh, the vertical post was a permanent structure. But the text tells us that Jesus was different. In John 19, 17 through 18, it says, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went up carrying his own cross. He carried his own cross to the place that is called place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with, and with him two other men on each side, and Jesus was between them. So it was truly his cross when Jesus was nailed to the cross, it wasn't done by driving the nail center in the palm because the nail would be pulled out through the middle and ring finger. Instead, the Romans found that if they would drive the nail towards the base of the palm, they could drive it under the transverse carpal ligament into the carpal tunnel, and at the same time, they would find that they would drive the nail through the median nerve. There's been studies done that show that the transverse carpal ligament is strong enough to hold the human body. And so the Romans found a way that they could drive a nail through the hand 
and that the hand would support itself, they would drive it through a nerve, which is described as, if you sever this nerve in your hand, they describe it as a continuous shock from a cattle prod, which would require the hand to clinch up and lock. They found a way to drive a nail through the hand, missing every artery, but hitting everything that would make it excruciating. And the feet were no different. They drove the nails between the second and third metatarsal bones. They missed the dorsal pedis artery, but they still hit the plantar nerves. After nailing Jesus to the cross and raising him up, as Jesus hung on the cross, it would not be difficult for him to breathe in. When the arms are outstretched and the diaphragm drops, It pulls in air. What would have been impossible for Jesus to do is exhale unless he pulled on his hands, pulling on that tendon, pushing with his feet to to push out air, all the while driving his exposed back up a rugged cross. I tell you this because when we read through the crucifixion story, we need to understand that when Jesus speaks, every single time, we know that preceding this, he had to pull with his hands, push with his feet, and drag his back up that cross in order to say anything. And in one of these instances, we see it in Mark 15, verse 34. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which is translates means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But did God forsake Jesus? Did God the Father forsake God the Son? How can God forsake him? God the Father and God the Son are unique in persons, but the same in purpose and in nature. And that's why in Acts 20, verse 28, when Paul's addressing the elders of the church, he says, shepherd the church of God, and listen to this, which he purchased with his blood. Meaning, God purchased the church with his own blood. Then how could God forsake him? If Ross were to come up, and I say Ross because if I sang, it would be horrible. But if Ross came up and began singing these words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You would be able to continue that song, correct? What Jesus is doing here is he's calling back to Psalm 22. And how does Psalm 22 begin? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is calling back to a psalm that the Jews would have remembered in the same way that if someone begins to sing Amazing Grace, we finish it easily. They would know Psalm 22 because it's a prophetic psalm of the Messiah. And so Jesus is calling back to Psalm 22, written 500 years before the Roman Empire. And if you will allow me, I want to go through a few of these verses as you begin to see the clarity of the prophecy of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Verses 7 and 8. All who see me deride me. They sneer. They shake their heads saying, turn him over to the Lord. Let him save him. Let him rescue him. Because he delights in him. We see this playing out in Matthew 27, 42. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross that we would believe in him. Verses 14 and 15. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a piece of pottery, and my tongue clings to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. This affirms the crucifixion. The stretch of the crucifixion would have caused dislocation of the joints. But we see evident as well Jesus' mouth being parched. It says, and my tongue clings to my jaws. I point that out because we're going to come back to it, so recall this. Recall this. 
Jesus' mouth is dried and parched. Verses 16, for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. 500 years before Jesus would be crucified, I'd say this describes a crucifixion pretty well, does it not? Verse 17 and 18, I count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and they cast lots for my clothing. You see, they broke the legs of those who were hanging on the cross because that would prohibit their ability to push up and draw out a breath. So what would it, what would it do? It would force them to stay down, to inhale, but to not be able to breathe out again. And if you recall at the crucifixion, they broke the legs of the men surrounding Jesus, but when they got to Jesus, they did not break his legs. A prophecy which is found in verse 17, I count all of my bones. But also we see in Matthew 27, verse 35, And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among themselves by casting lots. Verse 18 describes a scene perfectly. You see, prophecy is not, oh, it might come to pass or not. True prophecies come to pass exactly as it is prophesied. And we see that in verse 18. This is a prophetic psalm. The beginning of this psalm is exactly what Jesus was saying on the cross. He wanted to point the Jews to the psalm that prophesied of him, that prophesied of the crucifixion, because Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, and he is the one prophesied in Psalm 22. And for one of his painful breaths, he points back to the prophecy that points to him. He was not forsaken by God. Jesus was calling back to a prophetic psalm that the Jewish people would have known. Now, I mentioned his, his dry mouth, and this is where I want to close today. Matthew 27, 45 through 50. Now, from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That's, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, taking a sponge. He filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And the rest of them said, let us see if Elijah comes down. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he gave up his spirit. The same story is expressed in Mark 15, but only the Gospel of John tells us what he cried out. John 19, verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that the scripture would be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there. And so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, Jesus, when he had received sour wine, said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus called, if you recall earlier in the story, they offered him the sour wine and he refused. But now, as Jesus is coming to the end, coming to the, his death, it's as though he has something important to say. And so he calls upon something that would lubricate his vocal cords so that he could say it clearly and that it would be heard by those around him. He had something important to say. And that's what I hope we hear today as we examine the rugged cross, as Jesus pulls on his wrists, pushes with his feet, and drags his exposed and battered back up that cross he proclaims with his final breath, it is finished. What is finished? In his, it is finished in the Greek means to bring to a close, to finish, to end, to pay. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Meaning what is paid because of our sin is death. And when Jesus says it is finished, 
He's saying, it is paid. But not the sin up into the point of your conversion like the blood of goats and bulls and lambs. He says, I paid all of it. Instead of walking on wet cement, we now walk on fully dried cement, leaving no footprints behind, walking forward in our life, growing in his grace and his mercy, never to look back and see footprints again because he says, it is finished. You see, it is finished is such a simple phrase, but it is finished says everything. To some of us, it is finished says, I have brought your sins to an account. The sins that we could never bear, the sins that we have been fighting, that, 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 we, that we struggle with each and every day, that Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath that we wouldn't have to. To some of us, it is finished as saying, stop carrying your sins and your burdens. There's this, this imagery of us as, as we look back to Adam and Eve as they, they climbed the tree that they would sin and yet Christ climbs the tree that we would be saved from sin. And yet many of us, we keep trying to climb that tree over Jesus' battered body to pull our sins off of that cross so that we can bear it. Why? Why? The cross did not break under the burden of your sin. You seem to think your sin was too big to make it up there, but it isn't. It was put up there, and it was nailed there, and you keep trying to climb up there to pull it off. Why? It's finished. It's finished. Jesus takes all of our sin all of our addictions, all of our burdens, all of that weight that we've been carrying around that has been dragging us down, and he puts it on that cross, and he says it is finished. And when we don't believe that, when we still feel as though we have to carry our sin, when we still feel as though we have to carry this burden, what we're saying is it wasn't finished. But I think everyone in here would not dare question the words of our God, Jesus Christ, when he says it is. And so for some of you, this is a very difficult, these three words are very difficult to grasp. Because maybe you're like me. Maybe you're like me and you feel like, no, I've got to do something. I've got, to, I've got to prove myself. I've got to show God I'm, I care about this. I've got to show God that I'm committed. I've got to prove myself. But what you don't understand is what you're trying to prove yourself against is against things that will conquer you every single time. If we could conquer sin, then the cross would not have been required. And so you're waging war against sin in a battle that you would never win. And so it is finishes a challenge or challenging words because it's telling us to surrender, to leave it at the cross and believe and trust what he said is true. And that's difficult for some of us. And during this time of invitation, usually I'm in the back, but we're not doing that today. We're going to we're going to fill this altar and maybe it is finished is what is challenging you today. What is it that's making you wrestle with those three words? That's making you hear it and not accept it or not believe it? Are you still trying to carry your sin? Are you still trying to pull your sin off that cross? Or are you thinking that maybe my sin didn't make it up there? Just because you are still fighting your sin does not mean that you are condemned by your sin. What I mean is this. I want you to keep fighting your sin, but fight it in the understanding that there is victory already in it, not fighting it as one who has been defeated. Does that make sense? I had a hard time with this when I struggled for, for years with pornography. Pornography. 
It is different when you approach it from the mindset of understanding this sin has been conquered by my Savior and my Savior indwells me rather than I just don't want to do it because I don't want to let God down. Do you see the difference there? Because there's victory in fighting it with Christ and there is loss every single time when we're approaching it as though it's a work to receive his forgiveness and his love. It is finished. What is it that's making you wrestle with those three words? During this time of invitation, I'm going to be up here praying. I'm going to probably be up here crying and snotting my eyes out. What is it that's keeping you? What is it that's making you not believe it is finished? What is it that's making you continue this fight when Jesus already says it's won? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, it was, it was amazing to be able to go through your word and to see sacrifice and what you, what you gave us as an extending grace to us that we, wouldn't, that we would be able to have our sins addressed. But you knew that the blood of goats and lambs could not cover our sin. And so you did the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus, you are the greater sacrifice. And you entered this world and you bore our sins. And you bore them entirely. Every sin that we don't even know we're going to commit, you put it on that cross. That we would be free from sin, free from its torment, free from its guilt, free from its shame. And yet there are still many of us who very much feel that guilt and shame. I pray today, Lord, that this would be the day in which that guilt and that shame is lifted and removed and that we truly understand and see the cross for what it truly is. That it is a symbol of our freedom, that you bought us out of the slavery of sin, that you would call us sons and daughters. I pray, Lord, that we would be vulnerable during this time, that we would acknowledge our need for prayer, that we would come to this altar and lay it bare as you bore our cross on that sin. As you bore our sin on that cross, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.